have pellets just like the Alice? Exactly. Oh. Tank actually brought one up yesterday. But taking time to do skills like the wet exit and to do it slowly are like essential. It's boring, it's lame, it's cold. I've got water in my nose. You can, but uh, for the most part, if you practice and you've, you know, if you've had some, some training, that's great. Uh, you know, they can really kind of help instruct you, teach you how to properly do it so that you have those tools in your pocket to get you through those wet exits. My guidebook for Manitoba, 19 rivers, and most of those rivers, almost all of those rivers were threatened in some way. Uh, the watersheds were threatened by hydroelectric uh, um, pro programs and uh, road building, logging in particular, mining, all of those things. And there was no protection at all for the watersheds. We're right at the nice play rapids, and you saw those where we dumped, not all, <laughs> we, you know, um, I, you see it starts in Actually, it goes through two, two provinces. It starts in Ontario, goes through Woodland Caribou Park, and then crosses the border into Manitoba with three other First Nations. There are several um, pictograph sites along this route. Many are not, ma are not mapped. I don't put them in my... The only ones that I mark in my book are the ones that have already been advertised by government publications. Dolman markers, you can see them. They're, they're a global thing, and usually those are places where um, offerings are kept. It's a big rock, it's a table rock propped up with another rock. And uh, I, just, I just threw this in Wendigo just to, just to go along with my, then my bushel walk story. But <clears throat> um, there are lots of stories about um, uh, you know, evil entities, and, uh, frankly, and, and, and tricksters in the uh, indigenous uh, culture. Wendigo, everybody's heard of Wendigo. Who hasn't heard of Wendigo? Look at that. Everybody's heard of Wendigo. 80, 85 pounds. People complain now that, oh, my canoe's so heavy, it's like 35 pounds. <laughs> it's fishing, so it's, uh, and it's always been a good, a good fishing river. Of caribou, woodland caribou, um, chances are of seeing a caribou is probably pretty slim. Uh, I do expeditions throughout the year to some pretty awesome, remote, isolated places. Some of the most isolated parts of the world, literally hundreds of miles from the nearest road, airport, or in some cases, other living soul. But I started off, I'm sure, like many of you, uh, just as a kid growing up in Canada who loved the outdoors. A pretty long journey. It was a 4,000 kilometer canoe trip alone across Canada's Arctic. Now I know I said today I'm among kindred spirits, but if you can believe it, every once in a while, people will ask me, they'll say, why do you do these journeys? Are you not right in the head? What is it? Now, I know all of you know those reasons. Uh, you know what it's like to listen to the call of the loon and the crackle of your campfire on some wild, nameless lake in the North Woods. Uh, those early morning sunsets and the feeling you get getting out of your tent at five in the morning, put on your wet socks and paddling up in the frosty air, because you never know what might be around that next bend in the river. I mean, to tell you the truth, there are many things I love about it. I love the solitude. I love the sense of freedom that comes with wandering in a truly wild place. Where there's no designated campgrounds or trails or other people around. Uh, but maybe what I love most of all, and what I say is the definite upside of traveling solo, is all the wildlife I get to cross paths with in their natural habitat. I mean, their history today. But I assure you, I wrote that book. I wanted to dedicate it, actually. I said to my publisher, can I dedicate this book? You know, in the beginning, you always have a dedication in a book. I said, can I dedicate this to anyone who ever had to sit through a boring Canadian history class? They said, no, that won't go over so well. You better choose something a little safer. And the highways and the towns and the cities give way to the wilderness. And the wilderness itself would change. I mean, in the south, if you look on the map, you'll see that little dash of brown on the Great Lakes, that's the most southern ecosystem in Canada. It's called Carolinian Forest. Put the canoe on, load it up with all my rations, 10 minutes flat, I'm down the road and I'm into Long Point Bay. It's April, the ice is melted on the lake, and starting early. Wave at him. Maybe, oh, no, move! Oh, I love you, man. 
<laughs> we head up that system and it looks just like Kauai, like the quartzite hills and the turquoise water. Then you get into the north end, which is Tomogamy, and this is actually where they used to access Tomogamy. You get into the huge uh, uh, old growth pine, and then you get into the sturgeon, and go down the sturgeon, which to me is, is the big sister of the Spanish. So it's a little bit more difficult than the Spanish, but it's a good introductory river. You can portage everything. Watch a lot of the rapids, and the rapids that you do run are Swiss in class one, not even class one tap. And the scenery is just stunning. If you, you do the west branch, you need to be very a technical paddler. It's all pool and drop rapids, where the, the east branch is not. So I would do the east branch, it's a little, little bit easier. It's like, buddy, get some clothes on, okay? And then I looked, and there was a leech. And it wasn't in an area where I wouldn't want a leech to be. <laughs> and I didn't tell him for 20 minutes. <laughs> But you've got to go just a bit with this, these waterfalls. Now the portages are brutal. You actually literally have to bring a rope to rope yourself down. But, or you can start at the access or the end and paddle back up to the falls. Here's the portage. When I first went and did this river, the people I went with brought climbing helmets and harnesses. I'm like, you're joking, right? They were not joking. We continued, my buddy and I continued down uh, through the river where it flushes out into uh, uh, Lake Nipigon, which you haven't been, you have to. It's just a mecca. It's a, it's a small Lake Superior. Nobody paddles it. It's a very dangerous uh, lake at, at times, but it's full of pelicans and full of huge brook trout and, and stuff like that. So we did a five week trip there. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> Adventures it's happening at 12 45 p.m. at the Adventures and Talent Stage. We're talking in the Canadian wilderness. an adventure bucket list. Anybody here? Don't be shy. Yeah? And uh, it's a, a very pristine area, uh, very spiritual I found when we were doing this trip. And just to give you uh, an idea of where Wabakimi is actually located, there, there we go. Here's Wabakimi Provincial Park. And to put that into context, Wabakimi Provincial Park is about 200, 250 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. And to put that into perspective for myself, I live down here in the Niagara region of Ontario. Wait, uh, down here a couple of silly boys being silly boys just trying to take in some fun at an en route there and uh, posing with what would be the only moose we've seen on the entire trip. The docks getting ready to load, but we found out that uh, the plane that we had booked to fly out on, which was their De Havilland Beaver, is probably the picture that you've seen in their sign there, is uh, the red uh, beaver was uh, in for routine maintenance. These guys really maintain their equipment to keep us alive when we're flying in the air or landing on the water. Woo! They drop you 
off on a lake and you don't know what direction is what, right? So you got to get yourself on shore, get your Garmin in reach, get the compass out, whatever it might be, get your bearing of where you are, and off you go, set your travel and your destination. Just the, the landscape, it's, it's really different. It's really different. If you paddle to Mogami, you know, with all the old growth and stuff like that, when you go here, expect a different experience. Uh, Caribou River, just off of Smoothwater Lake. Smooth Water Lake, we're on it for like five minutes, like a little crit to go off. It was just something that uh, I, I've said it a few times throughout the presentation. It was very spiritual feeling. It, it had that sense of that feeling uh, through you that it's kind of a magical area, right? I get the same feeling when I'm in the Tamagami area. Before you knew it, we were back at the uh, the boat launch. Our respective uh, outfitters had dropped off our vehicles. Uh, I was a little more fortunate with my vehicle that it didn't end up in the hailstorm that Armstrong, Ontario had. And be sure to check us out on Tuesday evenings on New Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show. I make uh, camping videos and I post them on YouTube. Um, it's, uh, this is a little weird for me right now because uh, when I'm talking to my audience, I'm always talking to a little camera and uh, nobody's looking back at me. Um, but, uh, but it's nice, it's nice. I get to see all your beautiful faces. I've got my family here today, my beautiful girlfriend. I've got a whole bunch of friends that I've met in the camping community. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Ontario, and uh, it's appropriately named Diablo's Portage. Uh, so this front little stretch here where, where you see the main curve, that's like straight up. So there's, I believe there's an elevation gain of like 300 or 400 meters. Shot of uh, kind of the terrain you're dealing with, and um, I don't want to like hype it up and, and make it sound worse than it is, but I wasn't even able to actually get any footage of the worst part because it was just too treacherous. Um, but uh, no, 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 it's, it's, I think it's so hard to get to that it doesn't get a lot of pressure at all. Uh, comforting feeling, like it's uh, that feeling where you're, you're in the routine of the trip. And uh, this is where kind of uh, the unique, uh, the uniqueness of this lake, or sorry, of this route uh, presented itself. So Cairngorm Lake is one of the first main lakes of this route. And uh, back in the early 2000s, it got hit with an ex insane wildfire. I've never anything like that before. Uh, moving forward, uh, this is a creek going into Steel Lake from Cairngorm. So there was uh, one or two portages, as well as this tiny little creek. And uh, I don't know if this had anything to do with the, the wildfires so many years ago, but there were so many trees downed over the river that, that holds near and dear to me. Once I was uh, set up, luckily, uh, this was the next morning, I got to watch a beautiful thunderstorm uh, right from my tent. Uh, it was a huge milestone moment in my life. Um, if you notice this rock face here, I had just seen it in so many different books and uh, in videos of YouTubers that I look up to. And um, I, I had done all kinds of research before this, doing this trip, and it seemed that in every video that I'd watched, uh, someone was standing on this exact site and uh, to be standing there it just felt like such a moment where I was like following in the footsteps of, uh, of so many people who have inspired me and uh, really changed my life. A near brand new canoe that I was in, uh, this is only my second trip with it and I was just scraping the crap out of it. You can see I'm literally like on rocks right there talking about how wolves are the coolest thing to see out in the wild. So when he was talking about that I was just getting chills because this moment was like really one of the greatest moments of my life. I was, I was sitting there uh, drinking my coffee in the morning at my campsite and uh, this wolf came walking along. This, is, uh, this was super intense. So here's some satellite imagery. Uh, you've got log jam here, maybe another 100 meter stretch, another log jam, 50 meter stretch, log jam, log jam. Um, all it takes is one tree to fall into the river and stick itself into the mud and then all the trees that are upriver can fall in or, or whatever, especially during the springtime, during the melt, and then uh, they just pile up and jam up. My video is done, I just have to paddle across this little lake, pack my camera away, and then this paddle here ended up being one of the most challenging parts of the trip and I, I didn't film any of it. This, this again, like, took me all day, I was paddling against a headwind the whole time. Um, anyone that canoes here, which I'm sure is uh, the majority, knows that, that that feeling where you're paddling as hard as you can, and you're giving it everything you've got, and then you look at the shore, and the same tree is right there for half an hour. <laughs> uh, we got a local here, I love it. Um, so I'm 28 years old, um, 
my paddling skills, I define myself as an intermediate paddler. Um, I'm nothing like, you know, the legends out there who are sending uh, class four rapids with their eyes closed. Sorry, why I think I'm talking to you here today is my passion. I got all the passion in the world, all right? This is my thing. Uh, my whole energy here comes from trying to get each and every one of you out in the water, uh, getting to see people who have piled for the first time, just, you know, lights a fire inside of me. And uh, so if I could get even just one of you out in the water today, that would make my uh, life complete. Water. You can never really go and take a course and uh, think that you're just gonna hop right into things. Uh, you always wanna make sure that you're taking it easy and you start with your own comfort level. And usually that's always gonna be done on the flat water. For me, it all began with some uh, fishing trips with my dad and sprinkled in with some support from my mom. You need to know how to swim. Swimming is the most critical part of this entire endeavor. If you don't know how to swim, then you're really putting yourself and the others that you paddle with into danger. And uh, you know, as you can see here, during my uh, boreal river rescue course, they get you to dive in head first into the rapids so that you know what it's like to be there. And uh, when things go south, you know what to do. Well, things happen quickly. My girlfriend Phoebe over here can attest that uh, you know moving water is very humbling and things can happen very quickly. So to big moving water before, then you're not gonna know what it's like when uh, your canoe goes broadside or you end up flipping and, and these things can go very south very quickly. But you know if you start off small and you start off on some small streams, you'll get to know what it's like to read what we call read the water. Could ever possibly imagine having I've uh, paddled things that I just never thought I could paddle and it all started with this beautiful place that we call Paddler Co-op. Of course, and you're just out with people who are more proficient at paddling than you are and really taking that time to learn and focus on what it is that they're doing and how you can better your, uh, your techniques and your skills or maybe there's a trick that you just never even knew was out there. So it's just like boofing off a rock. I didn't know what boofing off a rock is. Does anyone here know what boofing off a rock is? Life jacket. You might need a helmet. You might need some gloves. You might need some boots. There's all kinds of things here, but it can seem a little bit daunting at first and uh, even expensive. But the way I see it is it's like investing in my mental and physical health. And to me, that's priceless. Shout out, shout out to just so many of you in the room here today uh, who have brought so much joy to my life. You've really helped me uh, find what you know, what keeps me ticking? I feel like uh, I've had a fire lit inside of me and, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to push you and plug this paddler co-op off too much, but that honestly was the place that changed my life. I just say, my advice to you is to start somewhere like the paddler, uh, paddler co-op on the Palmer Rapids. 